made it through the week. I didn't know if I was going to. I don't know. Has this been a rough week for you at all? Pastors aren't supposed to have rough weeks, but this was one of those. I'm glad, I'm glad that it's Sabbath. I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord with the people of the Lord. And I'm glad you're here too. I've entitled the last message in our series on prayer. And by the way, it's hard to wrap this up. I mean, there's just more and more and more. But um, we're going to start a, a series of messages on, on the family next week. And we've entitled the series on family that we're going to do, Modern Family, Vintage Values. So that's just a little preview, but... Um, I wonder if the enemy is mad about what's going on here because a lot of us have been under attack. And uh, he knows we've been talking about prayer and we're really uh, making a commitment to becoming a prayerful church. And then he knows we're going to be talking about the family, which he hates families, right? So maybe that's uh, what we're facing, but God is bigger. I've entitled the last message in our series, Breathe. Breathe. How long can you live without breathing? About four minutes, right? Before brain damage begins to occur, and then not long after that, uh, death follows shortly thereafter. Isn't that about right? At least that's pretty much, I think, what science tells us. Doctors tell us that a healthy person can hold their breath for right around two minutes. Now, when you think about that, if you haven't tried that, you might find out that you're not very healthy. I don't know. Two minutes is a long time when you're holding your breath. Now, they say that with practice, you can actually learn to about double that, to extend that out to four minutes, which is what pearl divers and, and so on, they, they're really at about the four-minute mark that they can hold their breath. And that's pretty impressive because they're swimming around under the water. They're, you know, exerting themselves. And, uh, and so that's, that's really amazing. But I, I'd like to do a little experiment. I'd like to find out how long you can hold your breath here this morning. And so in, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do this. We're going to do this all together. I'm going to do it with you. In a moment, uh, after when I count to three, I want you to exhale. And then I want you to inhale a nice healthy breath. And then I want you to hold it. And I'm, I'm going to time us up, up on, the, on the clock a little bit here. So on the count of three, exhale then inhale and just hold your breath, all right? We'll see how we do here. One, two, three. Now I'm going to talk, but I'm not going to breathe. I'm not cheating. That's 30 seconds. <laughs> I didn't say breathe. <laughs> Actually, don't hold your breath until you pass out, okay? <laughs> but that was 30 seconds. Now, how did it feel to take a big breath of fresh air? Didn't that feel good? I got a question. How do you feel about your prayer life? Someone said that prayer is the breath of the soul. Did you, do you feel about prayer like you just felt about taking that breath after holding it for 30 seconds? By the way, and nobody in Pastor Sven's family can answer this question, but by the way, do you know what the current world record for breath holding is? Okay, I hear somebody saying six minutes. Anybody else? Seven? So I, I heard it out there, and you probably won't believe this, but um, I, I'm going to back up. Actually, six and seven, that's not even close. Back on April the 30th of 2008, on the Oprah Winfrey Show, 
an extreme athlete by the name of David Blaine. I, I, by the way, prayer is advised. Holding, breathing is advised, right? Yeah, after you... Anyway, a guy by the name of David Blaine on the Oprah Winfrey Show held his breath for 17 minutes and 4 seconds. Now, at that time, he set the new world record. Turns out, there's this whole sport called static apnea, which means the temporary cessation of breathing. Now, now people who have this condition in their sleep have a serious medical condition in which they spend a lot of money in, in order to solve that problem. Here's an international sport that people actually practice and do on purpose. Maybe they have a serious medical or mental, I mean, you know, some kind of a condition that they should spend some money to solve too, right? I don't know. But, but, but go figure. And, and, and David Blaine, he actually practiced for six months in order to get to this place. Now, that was 10 years ago. And by the way, that record has been broken several times since then. A Swiss guy broke it at 19 minutes uh, a couple of years later. And then in 2013, a German diver broke it at 22 minutes. But do you know what the current world record on breath holding is? It's held by a Spanish young man, Spanish diver by the name of Alex Vendrell, and he held his breath for over 24 minutes. 24 minutes and 3 seconds. I heard someone over there say it. 24 minutes and 3 seconds. That's him right there. Now, doctors used to declare a person brain dead if they hadn't breathed in 5 minutes. Brain scans on free divers who are holding their breath for extended periods of time have turned up abnormalities and indicate brain damage. Lesson, don't hold your breath too long. It's dangerous. Even for extreme athletes, it's dangerous. And you and I, we should not do it. Amen? We should not do it. Is it possible that for many of us, we too are not breathing, praying enough, and therefore damage, serious spiritual damage occurs? Is it possible? Let's change that. Dear God, oh, how I pray that today you will help us come to the conviction that prayer should be as much a part of our lives and as natural as breathing because it is the breath of our souls. Speak to us, God. Convict us and call us to this new walk and new life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open our Bibles together to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. We hear a lot about prayer, but in spite of that, I know people who won't pray because they say they don't know how or they're worried about doing it wrong. So I have a question for you. Do you know how to breathe? If you know how to breathe, you know how to pray. And there's no wrong way. Here's the best defini definition that I've ever come across for prayer. It's in a great little book called Steps to Christ. It's one simple sentence, and it says this. If you're following along in your notes, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. That's what it is. Short, it's just that simple. Everybody knows how to talk to a friend, amen? We all do. Everybody can pray. You can talk to God without worrying about doing it wrong because talking to a friend, there's no wrong way to do it. You just talk to them. You just open your heart. Pray. Just open your heart to God like you talk to Him as your friend. He is your friend. 
So just open your heart to Him. And as we wrap up this prayer series, I have the question, why should we make prayer as much a part and as natural a part of our lives as breathing? We don't even think about breathing, right? It just happens. And, and that's what prayer should be to us. And I'd like to share with us three, three reasons uh, that, that prayer should be as natural a part of our lives as breathing. Number one, if you're following along in your notes, Jesus gives us an example of constant prayer. Jesus Himself gives us that example. And if He is our example in all things, then why wouldn't we want to pray as He prayed? You see, in Luke 5, and, and coming up, I want to give you the context. Jesus has begun His ministry. He, he's been, you know, the Lord has been working through Him mightily for, for a little bit of time. And, and He's been preaching. He's been healing. He's been working miracles. He's been casting out demons. He's been cleansing lepers, you know, giving blind people sight, doing all these amazing things. His fame is spreading, and, and the crowds that are following Him are just huge. It's an amazing time. Now keep that in mind as we look at Luke 5, verses 15 and 16. However, the report went around concerning Him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by Him of their infirmities. Verse 16, So He Himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Important lessons about prayer that we learn from Jesus. Right here, number one, in your notes, Jesus prayed often. That's what the Bible says. Verse 16 says, He often withdrew to pray. Jesus didn't do it a little. He did it a lot. Jesus didn't do it when He had time for it. Jesus did it when He made time for it. And He made time for it a lot. He prayed often. And so, in the same sense, if He's our example, we, we, need, we breathe all the time, we should pray that much. We should pray often. Second of all, Jesus, the Bible says, that He prayed in private. He withdrew into the wilderness to pray, is what the Bible says. Now, now last time I, I, the last message I presented was about praying together. And so, please, we're not talking about opposing things going on here. It's not, well, pray together or pray in private. It's what? It's both, isn't it? We need, to be, we need to be praying together because there are prayers that will not be answered if we just pray them alone. Some prayers will only be answered as we pray together corporately. We see that in the Scripture. But, but here Jesus has given us an example that He prayed in private where He would not be interrupted by prying eyes and curious ears as He really poured out His heart to God. You see, he wanted to be where the TV and the smartphone and the computer and the radio and well-meaning people would not interrupt him and distract him and, and uh, take his attention away. He wanted to be where the ping of Facebook wouldn't, uh, you know, pull him off into that world. And, and he wanted to be where he didn't have to worry about Instagram and, 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 all, and Twitter and whatever else is going on. He wanted to be in private so he could focus. And third, and this is very, very interesting to me as I, as I realize this in Scripture. Catch this. Jesus prayed when things went well, not just when they didn't. Okay? Jesus prayed when things went well, not just when they didn't. And that's a very important point because we have this tendency to forget to pray when everything's going well in our lives, and, 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 but then as soon as we get into trouble and something bad's happening, we're all over prayer. Dear God, oh, I need you, God. Help me, God. Come near me, God. Please give me strength, God. Please get me through this, God. Show me the way. All over it when things go wrong, but when things are going great, we don't feel the need so much to pray. And, and here's what I find really interesting is that Jesus, here in Luke, he has, He's at the height of His popularity. I, I mean, things could not be going better. Crowds, huge crowd. People are flocking to Him. They are so excited. They're getting ready to crown Him King. It's a time of heady success. Things could not be going better. Miracles are happening left and right. And, and it's right in this moment of greatest success that Jesus, the Bible says, prayed often. You know what? We need to pray more when things are going well. 
than when they're not. That's what I really believe. We need to pray more when things are going well than when they're not. Why? Because it's when they're going well that we are most vulnerable to the enemy. Isn't that right? Because when things are going well, we're far more likely to be depending on ourselves. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Because he knows he can get us so easily if we're depending on ourselves. That's when we're the most vulnerable. And so perhaps this is one of the most important lessons that we learn from Jesus about prayer is that we should pray more when things are going well. That we would keep our hold on God. That we would keep our dependence on God. That we would not begin to let the success that's happening go to our heads and take us away from depending on Him. And then I want you to think about this fourth lesson. If the Son of God needed to pray, how much more should we? Jesus wrapped His divinity in humanity. Jesus identified with our weaknesses, and His humanity made prayer a necessity. Not just a good idea, not just a nice option, not just a wonderful thing to do. It made prayer a necessity. And I repeat, Although He was God, Jesus' humanity made prayer an absolute necessity. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, it tells us that Jesus spent whole nights in prayer. Whole nights in prayer. If humanity was so much of a problem to our Savior, God in the flesh, that He had to pray. How much more should you and I, weak, sinful mortals as we are, how much more should you and I feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer, just like breathing? Well, let's continue in our Bibles. That brings me quite nicely to the second point that I want to make. Let's go over in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and we'll, we'll begin reading in verse 29 in a moment. Reason number two that prayer needs to be as natural as breathing to us is because we find strength for our weakness. We find strength for our weakness. No one knows better than we ourselves how morally weak we really are. Isn't that true? We have secret things hidden in our lives in dark corners that we hope nobody will ever, ever find out about it. We have such good intentions but so often, that's all they ever amount to is intentions. We never follow through. There's, they never amount to action. And, and, and so we need strength in our lives. We need, we, we need this extra boost because we struggle. We're sinful. We're broken people. And it's okay to admit that, church. We don't have to come up all in here in our nice dresses and suits and you know painted faces on and, and, and pretend to be something. It's okay to be real. And we're weak and we struggle. And things aren't as good as they appear. And, and, and you know, of course, the statistics are showing that especially among young people, there's a lot more of depression and everything. Why? Because Facebook and Instagram, it doesn't paint the real picture. Oh, everybody's life is so perfect and I have all these perfect things going on and we see all these, you know, Photoshop pictures. I mean, now on your smartphone, they even give you a little app right there that when you take the picture, you can adjust the picture before you tweet it so that it looks better and it flatters you more. And it makes you bigger where you want to be bigger, and it makes you smaller where you want to be smaller, and all kinds of things. I mean, they do. And so what we're looking at is not reality, but we forget that, and we judge our lives by it, and we get depressed. But I love what the Bible says. You see, prayer gives us the strength we need for our weakness. Isaiah 40, he gives power to the weak. The Bible says. And to those who have no might, He increases strength. Even the youths will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord... And when you see wait on the Lord, that's another way of talking about prayer. Coming to God in prayer. Waiting on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even those in the prime of life, the Bible says, 
the young men, all full of strength and vitality and vigor. It says even they are going to faint and they're going to get weary and they're going to utterly fail and fall. In other words, the Bible is trying to help us understand that the best of human strength will what? Fail us. The best of human strength will fail us. Our promises are like ropes of sand, and the knowledge of our failed promises fills us with personal doubt about our own sincerity and commitment to Jesus, and the devil loves to use that to beat us up and push us down and knock us under. And we need strength for the inner battles that we face, and I can relate to that, and maybe this prayer that I came across, you can relate to it too. It's a great prayer. It says, Dear Lord, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, or selfish. I haven't even eaten any chocolate. I'm really grateful for that. But dear Lord, in a few minutes, I'm going to get up out of bed. And then from now on, I'm going to need a lot more help. Do you feel like that sometimes? I sure do. So it's not just the inner struggles that we have. Temptations and sin and guilt and shame. It's not just the inner stuff. On top of that, there's life. Just life around us. And that can get a little overwhelming at times, can't it, church? I feel that way honestly. To be just completely honest, I feel that way right now. Overwhelmed with all the heartache and pain that's going on amongst you people that I love and care about. Let alone what's out there in the world. And I, I mean, I don't even have time to stay up with all the news, and I'm glad because it would just probably wipe me out. Because there's too much. The little bit I know is too much. But what I know, the little bit I know about what's going on here, it's heavy. For starters, many of you are battling with, with very serious health problems, challenges, cancer and heart disease, and diabetes. And it's heavy on you. And then there's families in crisis, marriages hanging by a thread, people feeling like they're trapped in situations that they hate, that there's no hope of reconciliation or, or turning it around, and children leaving the Lord, and going out into drugs, and wasting their lives, and broken-hearted parents, and it weighs on you. It breaks my heart. And then people without jobs, wondering where the money for the next meal is going to come from, or the next rent payment to keep a roof over their head. And it beats me up emotionally. And then, not to mention the, the silent grief that some of our aging members are going through not only for themselves or maybe it's for a loved one that's developed some kind of a condition that the doctors can't cure and they aren't even really sure what to do with it or how to treat it and so all, all, all you can do is watch your loved one or watch yourself just go on living into this slow demise. It takes its toll on me. And I haven't even talked about those struggling with addictions that are killing them and the ones they love most around them. I don't know what the addictions all could be. I mean, pornography, alcohol, meth, prescription pain pills, whatever it might be. It crushes me. And by the way, we don't talk about addictions because we're not supposed to have them, but guess what? The church is the place we're supposed to be able to come for help with this stuff. Isn't it, church? And I just want to i just want to say I'm so proud and I'm so grateful for those that have had the courage in this congregation to come and sit down in my office and say, Pastor, this is what I'm struggling with. And you know what? They're not this fellowship. They're still here. And we're on a journey and we can do this together. That's why God gives us the body. So it's okay. And the, the, the only thing that's not okay is to keep hiding it. And pretending it's not there. We want to go on this journey together and have the Lord get us through these things together. And so my heart is breaking as, as I think about these things. 
and I feel so weak, and I feel so inadequate, and maybe this is my problem, but I feel like I should be able to solve all these things because I'm your pastor and I represent God to you, but I can't solve them. And I feel like I'm failing you and I'm failing God, and it's heavy stuff. So what do you do? What do you do when the people you care about so much are in so much pain and there's nothing that you can really do about it? I'll tell you what you do. You pray. You pray. You cry out to Jesus because He understands it all. That's why Isaiah said that those who wait upon the Lord would renew their strength. And by the way, they would mount up with wings like eagles and they would run and not get weary. They would become strong. When we wait on the Lord, when we come near Him in prayer, the weak become what? Strong. You see, that is my only hope here in this thing. If I didn't have this promise, I could tell you I'd have been in loony land a long time ago. They'd have me in a, in a little white room with padded walls and a lock on the outside of the door. It's the only hope that God's going to renew our strength. And if we wait upon Him, if we come to Him in prayer, it's going to be able to lift those burdens. Here's a great quote. Prayer to the great physician for the healing of the soul brings the blessing of God. Prayer unites us with one another and with God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side. Don't you love that? Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives new strength and fresh grace to the fainting, perplexed soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for that. We need to pray like we breathe because that's where we get strength for our weakness. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Brings me to the last thing that I really want to emphasize this morning or this afternoon as we wrap up our series on prayer. Acts chapter 4. Reason number three to pray like we breathe is because prayer is the secret of spiritual power. Prayer is the secret of spiritual power. We receive divine power only through prayer. And in order for you and I to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual interaction with our Heavenly Father, and that's why He's given us prayer. If we want to have life flowing in us, we're the branch, and we need to be connected to the vine where those streams of life-giving energy and nourishment come from. And that's what prayer does. It is communion with God, and that's what brings His mighty power into our lives. You see, prayer is not about helping God know who we are and what we need and all this stuff. He already knows all that way better than we even do ourselves. Isn't that right? He already knows it all better than we do ourselves. Prayer doesn't bring God down to us. It brings us up to God. And therein, lies the limitless, unstoppable power to which God has given us the privilege to connect. It's through prayer that's going to do this for us. And here in Acts chapter 4, the disciples are in big trouble. Persecution and opposition are mounting all around them. Peter and John have just finished healing the lame man by the temple gate. And because of that, they've been thrown in jail overnight. And the next day, they're hauled out of jail and they're hauled in before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish Supreme Court. And, and they're forbidden to preach Jesus and they're severely threatened if they disobey the Sanhedrin's orders. They say, you got it easy this time. Next time, it's going to be a lot worse if you keep preaching Jesus. Now, now, Peter and John, when they heard that, they immediately knew that it was only going to get worse because they were going to keep on preaching Jesus. They weren't about to stop. They were going to keep going. And so they knew the heat was going to get turned up. And so they get released and they go to their friends. And when they get to their friends, you know what they do? They pray. And notice what happens after they pray. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, 
Oh, I'm going to stop right there. I'll come back to this. I'm going to get distracted for a minute. The place, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together. Notice, they were not praying alone, were they? They were praying, how? Together. The place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. By the way, I'm not done reading, but i got to just stop here and camp on this for a minute too. They were all, the Bible says, filled with the Holy Spirit. See, I'm not interested in, in a pastor or two or three or four getting filled with the Holy Spirit or one or two or three church members. You know what I'm interested in? All. Everybody sitting in this congregation filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what that would be like if we were all filled with the Holy Spirit? And I know how we can get there. If we will come together and pray together for the Holy Spirit, God's going to pour Him out like that. That's what He did in Pentecost for the disciples. They were all praying together, and everyone who was there got filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, there's no question that the secret to spiritual power is prayer. We see it right here in Acts. And, and you show me a powerless church and I will show you a prayerless church. But here in Acts, the apparent defeat turns into what? Victory, that's right. Prayer turns apparent defeat into victory. And prayer will do that here in Richardson, in our congregation. It will do it in your family. It will do it in your personal life. Prayer will turn apparent defeat into victory. I already talked about this a little bit, so I won't have to camp here too long. But it says the Holy Spirit is poured out through prayer. After the believers prayed together, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be praying together. If we really are serious about revival and receiving the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we call the latter rain, just before Jesus comes, we have got to pray for it. Jesus told us to ask for the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the single greatest thing that we can do to receive the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to pray, pray, and pray together. That's the single greatest thing. Last of all that I want to mention here is that prayer is really an exciting, it's the foundation of an exciting walk with God. It's a foundation of an exciting walk with God. Verse 33 says that they were witnessing to Jesus with great power and great grace was upon them all. Now notice that Luke didn't just write here and say they were witnessing with power and grace was on them. He didn't say just power and grace. He said what? Great power and what? Great grace. He emphasized that. And it happened because they prayed. Life in the early church was exciting. The walk and relationship that people had with Jesus, with one another, was exciting. It was vibrant. God was moving in marvelous ways. And sometimes I wonder if we're not excited about church because it's just all whole hum. We're just in some kind of a rut. And I really think we need to pray ourselves out of this. And recover some passion and some energy about what God is doing here in our midst. We, I, 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 when are we going to get it? You know, about this prayer thing. And it needs to be like breathing. I mean, I, I, I hear about church folk. You know, we don't have time to pray. Why? Well, because we got to see our favorite TV program. You know, I hear about church folk that that they're just like hooked on, on, on the Kardashian deal. And when they're not at work, they're glued in front of the TV. See, what's happening next in that messed up world? But we don't have time to pray, but we have time to just burn up on the Kardashians. Are they going to get us into the kingdom? Are they going to save a lost soul? 
Lord, help us if we can't breathe spiritually because we're suffocating on the garbage of the culture around us. You know, Pastor Sven, when he preaches every once in a while, he says, this is angry pastor. Well, guess what? He ain't got the corner on angry pastor. You see, we're not going to have power without prayer. And if we don't pray, for sure we're not going to have any power. Listen to this quote. It says, much prayer is necessary to successful effort. Prayer brings power. And that's why you say, you know, that's why we have praying for our like lists. But you know what? And, and we're trying to get this going through our Sabbath school classes. But you know something I've heard? You know what? I, 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 I heard this. And you know, it mustn't be true. It can't be true. It's just a bad rumor. It's just got to be bad gossip. But I heard that some of our Sabbath school classes don't want to take three or five minutes to pray for the light cards and to be interrupted with praying for people that need to know Jesus better. Now, excuse me. If you are so spiritually bankrupt that you don't want to be interrupted, hello, in your theological mumbo-jumboing to pray for a soul, may God have mercy on you. That is absolute, utter nonsense, church. I am sick and tired of Sabbath school classes being nothing but theological treatising and arguing some opinions back and forth. Sabbath school is where we get ready to save some lost souls. Sabbath school is where we build relationships and pray for each other and pray for our friends who aren't here yet. That's what Sabbath school is for. And if you don't want to pray in your Sabbath school, I'm going to come and shut it down. You have no business being in a class that's that selfish that wrapped up in yourselves and your comfort. See, you don't care about people going to Christless graves and you don't want to take five minutes to pray for them. Sorry about that. I don't know where that came from. We got to get our priorities together, church. Prayer brings power. Prayer has subdued kingdoms and even indignant pastors. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched this violence of fire, turned to flight the enemies of aliens. Christian workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves to what? To think, to pray, to wait upon God for renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting of His Spirit. That's what we need. You know, E.M. Bounds wrote, a lot of classic, classic books on prayer. If you've never read E.M. Bounds, you will be so blessed, you'll be so inspired. And he notes, E.M. Bounds does, that the men who most fully illustrated Christ in their lives and their character and who most powerfully affected the world for him have been men who spent so much time in prayer that it was really a notable feature of their lives and, and people couldn't miss it and people commented on it. And I just want to share with you a few of these people. I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen. This guy is Charles Simeon. He devoted from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. every day to prayer. John Wesley, you know him. He spent two hours from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. praying. Someone who knew him well said of Wesley, he thought prayer to be more his business than anything else, and I have seen him come out of his closet with a serenity of face next to shining. Reminds you of Moses, right? Coming down into the presence of God. John Fletcher, they said of him that he stained the walls of his room with the breath of his prayers. Luther. Luther said, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. 
I have so much business, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. That was Luther. Samuel Rutherford rose at three in the morning to meet God in prayer. And Joseph Aline rose at 4 a.m. for his business of praying until eight. I'm so convinced, dear ones, that if we want to be a great church for God, we must be great prayers. Great prayers. And I want to invite my, my dear friend Curtis Elcock and Linda's wife to come up here. You know, as we embarked on this, uh, Curtis, you're here, aren't you? You didn't forget about second service, right? Oh, okay, I see Linda. Oh, there he is, okay. Come on up here. You know, months and months ago, as I began sensing a burden and realizing, hey, we, we need to get serious about this, this prayer thing, I began praying and saying, God, will you raise up? Will you call some? I don't want to pick someone, God. I want you to do that. And so I began praying, and I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my pastoral staff. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. I just prayed. I said, God, will you please call someone? And I prayed for months and months and months, and that prayer didn't get answered. It's because Curtis is so slow to hear. <laughs> and finally, the most exciting thing happened. It was the Sabbath that we began this series on prayer. This brother got up to have the intercessory prayer. He said, you know, church, he said, I've been running away from this, but God showed me and called me to a prayer ministry here at the church. And I'm so excited and I'm praising God so much because I know God wants to do That's why the devil is, well, go ahead, just share. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, it's very interesting. I was just outside conversing a bit with Elder Emika, and I don't think he even knows this. But the, like Pastor said, the first service when he started the series, during that week my wife and I was troubled. I was um, being tossed between working with the guys in the Allen First Church. And I said, God, you, you tell me what you want me to know. And I said to her, you know what, I think I'm interested. I think God is leading me towards uh, prayer ministry because I did it in the islands before and I probably should be doing the prayer ministry. And I said, Lord, if you want me to do this, send me a sign. Well, <laughs> you better be careful where you sell God at times. So I, we decided we we're going to go for a walk. And I had my phone. I walked out and we started walking and my phone vibrated. And I took the phone up and I looked at it. And it has a Elder Emika text from him. I said, well, why is he sending me a text? So I opened the text, and as I opened the text, the text read, Elder, could you please pray for us this Sabbath for a service, the intercessory prayer? I was like, no, this can't be. <laughs> this, this is it, right? This is not correct. And my wife said, what are you looking at? And I showed her, and she was like, you asked for an answer. In less than 20 minutes, the answer came. And um, I have been running from this for many years, brethren. We, we run from God like Jonah. Like I told Pastor yesterday, I'm like a Jonah. And uh, God has used me in various occasions where I've prayed with individuals, I've prayed for individuals. And I've seen individuals gotten healed through prayer. But not only that prayer, that aspect of it, but the aspect of it is I found out the less I pray, the less I want to evangelize. The, west, the less I want to tell people about God soon coming. And as we look at the time around us, it is very evident that we are getting, we don't know, we are getting closer and closer each day. We don't know. So I decided that I'm going to follow God's leading, let him guide, and I'm going to take on the responsibility of being one of the co-partners with the prayer ministry here in this church. And I have a number of dreams that I've put together for this plan. We have a membership of about 1,000 members here. And I pray that at some point in time in the very near future, we can have at least 25% of our members praying. And by doing that, we will have a prayer vigil 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Brethren, I believe we are coming to the time where 
we are going to see a lot of miracles. I've, I don't know if it's visions I'm getting or it's, it's just scary to think about the way God is going to move. Our families are under attack. Our individual lives are under attack. And I'm just thinking about a quote in the book, Great Controversy, Sister Wright wrote. She talks about how the distractions of the world are going to keep us away from praying. We have to make a decided effort, just like Daniel did. Daniel decided that he is going to stand regardless of what happened, and he prayed three times a day. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of commitment I'm looking forward to having in my own personal life so that I can grow. Because the most scary thing that can happen is when Christ comes, he said, I never knew you. Mm. And that text runs uh, right now. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. How could somebody walk for 40, 50 years in this faith, in this movement, and when Jesus returns, he looks at them and he says, I never knew you. Because we were doing it in our own strength, we were doing it with our own power, and we were doing it for our own gain. Mm. I stand here humbly in front of you, saints of God, and say to you that I just want God to use me to do his bidding. God is real. Jesus is real. The last six to eight weeks has been tumultuous for us right here, this young lady. <laughs> we have been through some difficult times, and uh, I think it's probably some of the worst times after we decided to do this prayer ministry. Mm. And I know it's Satan, he doesn't want us to do it. Because he know with prayer, there's going to come power. And with the power of God's plan is going to be implemented. And life is going to be a much better, we're going to be in a much better place mentally preparing for the end time as we continue to pray. So let us pray and support this ministry. And Pastor, we want to thank you for the excellent sermons that you have given us. And the last thing I will say to us on July the 21st of this of next month, 21st of July next month, we're going to have after the second service a meeting for all of the individuals. And I say this with respect. If you think that you are called to be a part of this prayer ministry and you feel that you're being called, we want you to come and join us. It may not be now, but eventually some other individuals will get the call as God works through us. But we are asking for individuals right now who genuinely believe that they are being called and they can be a part of this great ministry. And God is going to do great things for us as his people. We're going to see lives transformed and we're going to see people coming out. And lastly, I don't want it to be anything to go out. We're not going out to the hospitals. We're not going anywhere outside. We want the prayer to start in here. If the house is full of prayer, when that prayer infiltrates and permeates in the house just like a cup and starts to run over, guess what we're going to do? We're going to eventually go out and that message is going to be shared with others. So the main focus of it right now is here in Richardson Church. Let us become a prayer church. 250 or more of our members. Thank you and God bless you all. And enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Jonah. <laughs> I praise God for Jonah's. They hear the call and God use them in a mighty way. I'm, I'm looking forward. And I know God has a plan for this ministry. I, I, I'm just going to skip through kind of the rest, rest of the message wrap up. There, there's just a couple great, more powerful quotes, but, but they're in your, in your notes and, and you can read them. You know, prayer is the breath of the soul. It is the secret of spiritual power. No other means of grace can be substituted and health of the soul be preserved. I, it's just powerful. I'll, I'll let you guys go through that on your own in your notes. But I do want to, I didn't put this quote in your notes as I, as I wrap up. That wonderful book, Steps of Christ. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant <laughs> To pray. When prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. Why should we, 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 we be reluctant? 
We're his sons, we're his daughters, and, and, and we're his kids, and God wants to just lavish spiritual power and blessing upon us. And don't forget that the darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. And the adversary, he's continually trying to block our way to the throne of mercy so we don't get the grace and power we need to resist him. But around those who pray is light and joy and peace and strength. And so I call us to open up our lives to this experience. Prayer is power. Period. And my challenge today as we wrap up this prayer series is not to let our thought of prayer, not to let our thinking of prayer and our attention on prayer, not to let it end. The series of messages is over, but the life of prayer is not and the call to prayer is not. And I challenge us, I challenge us to go from here today with a commitment to make prayer and allow God to help prayer become in our lives as natural as breathing. Breathe, church. Breathe. Breathe. Never quit. Would you please, for God's sake, make this commitment today? I covenant with God to double the time I spend praying each day. That's why today, instead of one minute in praying for our like list that Pastor Sven did, that's why he did... Two minutes. So I said, Pastor Sven, let's, let's double it. Two minutes. And if you're praying 10 minutes a day right now, I'd encourage you by God's grace, double that to 20 minutes. If you're praying 15 minutes, double it to 30. If you're praying 30 minutes, make it an hour. Let's become a church on our knees. Let's connect to the wellspring of life and spiritual energy. And let's just do it.